the weed, weed guys that you have, okay? And we, we'll go over that on, review some of that on Tuesday as well, okay? So what I'd like to do today then is continue on this weed crop competition, okay, uh, components. And uh, this whole idea of constant final yield, and if you remember from last class, what I had talked about is that there are very few laws in ecology, okay? Contrary to physics, where you've got a whole bunch of laws. And this is one, and the whole idea behind, behind this relationship is that once you get past a given density, okay, your total yield of the system, the carrying capacity is reached, you're then going to flatten out. And remember I said, you know, one important agronomic implication of this is that we plant at ideal or what we think are optimum rates, seeding rates, to obtain maximum yield. Basically, to, if we can figure out what that, this point is where basically you've got exponential growth and then you've got this asymptote, that, that you know, no use planting and, and paying a lot of money for extra seed if you're not going to get a benefit from them. And that's why we talked about this whole thing with 30,000 corn plants. Why do they decide that? Why do you have optimum? And again, it's based on this. A lot of that work has already been done. People didn't just you know, come up with the number. They, they did the work. They looked at spacing. Okay? And folks are still working with, with densities and so forth, depending on what the outcome is. If you're looking at silage, you might be you know, wanting to alter the, the densities a little more. But generally, this is the case. Okay, and then the idea is, well, can we alter this if we add, you know, we add resources? For example, if we fertilize, could we push, change the general shape of that curve or that relationship? And the answer is no, but also in, in some ways, yes. The, the general relationship doesn't change. So these are nutrient level one, two, and three in increasing order. You, as you can see, the total yield per unit certainly is increased. I mean, you do have more resources. These are inputs. But the general shape of the curve doesn't change, okay? So you're still going to have your 30,000 plants. However, in terms of the yield, it's going to be much greater. But it's not going to allow you to go 35,000 or 50,000 plants and allow you to increase the yield. Do you see it? So yes, on an individual plant basis, you can increase and the total yield increase. Otherwise, we wouldn't be fertilizing. Why fertilize if this thing would just stay at N1, okay? But what I'm saying is you're not seeing a shift. You're not seeing these curves look like this, basically a direct relationship. As you increase the density and fertility, you got these you know, diagonal lines going up. There isn't that kind of a relationship. This still holds true. So law of constant final yield is an important concept. Okay? From a weed management perspective, what it's telling you is, and I think somebody in the group might have mentioned that, if you've got a crop and you've got weeds growing in there, remember, plants and weeds are very different from insects, from pathogens, because why? What's the main difference? And we, you know, we really hammered this in in IPM, but what's the main difference between when you're looking at pests that's, that's a weed relative to a pathogen or, or an insect? They're always going to be there. They're always going to be there, but what's even more important than that? Because I could say, you know, pathogens are going to be there. Exactly, exactly. Remember, they're primary producers. They're competing for the same resources as your crop, your favor favorable species. Whereas insects or pathogens are usually going to be impacting, you know, they're not competing for nutrients directly. Indirectly, they will. So now you have direct competition, okay? So in terms of their impact, it's pretty severe because they're not going to sit there and say, well, you know, you take half and I'll take half. Remember we talked about asymmetric competition? Weeds are going to take, you know, proportionally more nutrients than their density. So if you've got two plants, you know, you've got corn and you've got velvet leaf growing, the velvet leaf and you've got, you know, say a hundred, a proportion of a hundred percent of a given nutrient, they're not going to split it 50-50, you know, nitrates. It's probably going to be 80% going to, to velvet leaf and maybe 20 to your crop because they, they're much better, stronger competitors, okay? So that's what this means. So if you think about this not just being your crop, you now have your weed in here. You've got 30,000 corn plants. On top of that, say you have you know, 5,000 or 20,000 weeds growing in between. Guess what? This thing is going to just, they're going to be taking those nutrients straight out of there, and this is still going to flatten out, except that the, the, comp, the, the total yield is going to be comprised of your corn, probably half the yield you would have gotten without any weeds, 
and the other half might end up being just wheat biomass, which is not very helpful to you, okay? So that's the implication, is that these weeds are competing for the same resource, okay? Remember we talked about, so how do you get this relationship, okay? Remember we, we went back, how do you get this relationship? What happens? How, how can you get more plants planted, but the total yield when you harvest them, if I have 30,000 plants, I harvest, I get this yield, and if I have 60,000, okay, I harvest them and I have the same yield. What happens on an individual plant basis? Or even, even, even if all of them were to actually germinate and emerge, you, you would harvest more plants, but all the plants would be smaller. Exactly. Okay? More, the same number of individuals, and that's assuming we don't have this self-thinning, this mortality that occurs, that's density dependent. I'll say a little more about that. But this is what this is showing. And you have that table. What it's looking at is in a very simple way, this is a pot experiment, but it, it's, it's realistic of what goes on in reality. This is the dry weight yield of redroot pigweed, Amaranthus retroflexus, a function of density. So here's the density, number of plants per pot, one plant, five, 15, 25, 35, in a single pot. And what they did is they allowed the plants to grow. I forgot how long they did. They have four replicates. This is done. Um, I believe they allowed the plants to, to get at least two months they grew the plants, okay? So, and then what they did is they harvested them, they dried, dried biomass, okay? And here's, here's the results. On a per pot basis, basically the one plant you had produced 6.2 grams of dry weight, okay? Five plants produced 6.9. 15 plants, 6.2. Do you notice that this, I mean, it goes up a little bit, but it's, it's, it's not like you're getting, oh, 35 plants and you're getting 85 grams, you're not. It's flattening off. Then when you kind of look at individuals, you weigh each individual, the 35 plants, you weigh each individual, look what happens. Look at the weight. The one plant was 6.2 grams. It was there by itself. It took up all the nutrients it could, okay? But when it was sharing it with five others, now the five plants, their average weight was 1.38 grams. You notice exactly what Steve just said, is that on a per plant basis, each of the plants, they're still there in many cases, but they're all small. They're generally smaller, okay? That's why you get that flat. Now, if you're a grower, you don't want this, okay? You want to be able to get that ideal weight, okay, that ideal biomass or density that gives you this maximum, okay? So that's really what's happening. And if you would sow, you know, corn at 60,000 plants per acre, you would probably get the same yield that you get at 30,000, okay? that all your corn plants would be this high. If that's what you're looking for, that's the way to go. And that doesn't mean we can't move away from 30,000. You know, you can go 5,000 a little more. You can, you know, for silage, you can increase it a little more. But generally speaking, that law is, is consistent in, in agronomic, in natural areas. That is all based on carrying capacity. Do you all get that? So smaller, smaller plants, and I'll, and I'll say a little more, okay? So competition for nutrient depends on the specific nutrient okay, limiting conditions that may exist. And the key is that different species will have different requirements for nutrients. Red root pigweed will not compete for nitrate in the same way perhaps as, as uh, ragweed. So it's very species specific and I want to just throw that out initially so that you don't, okay. And what these plants do, uh, oh that reminds me, one thing, there are a lot of different slides here that because I've, I've updated this that you don't have and what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to basically print out this PowerPoint presentation and make it available to you with each of the, the figures so you can, you can you know, have this information, okay? I'll have it to you by Tuesday. So, so I just you know, I realized that this is updated and, and you, you had kind of a, an older version of the notes. So it's in addition to whatever, whatever I've given you. But what I want to show you here is the chemical composition of corn and corn weeds in an experiment. Okay, you know, in the 1950s, but it's, it's really what I'm trying to show you is that each of the species has different, okay, concentrations of nutrients. And usually their concentrations are directly related to their ability to take them up. So a species like pigweed that has high, rel and lamb squirter, high relative to corn nitrogen content in its leaves and its biomass, that, that nitrogen is coming from somewhere. It's coming from the ground, it's coming from fertilization, okay? And so, um, you know, you're not going to be surprised if some of these species are, you know, tremendous competitors, very, very, 
uh, vigorous competitors for, 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 in this case, for nitrogen. And it's true for some of the other, look at, look at uh, potassium, pigweeds, and, and lamb scores. Look at the storage of these guys, whereas look at corn, okay? So what, what, also, what often happens is that these, okay, these are, this is the average for the weeds, and look at, the, look at nitrogen and corn. I mean, if these guys are competing together, guess who's getting most of the nitrogen? Okay, so timing, when you're going to apply, how you apply the nitrogen is going to be extremely important. If you have them in the, if you do this in the presence of weeds, I can guarantee you're wasting your money. Because they are going to take it up. There is no question. We've done work showing this. And part of it is take a look at the, the content. So there's a direct relationship between percentage composition of a given nutrient to their ability of the plant to take it up. That's what I'm getting here. And it does vary by species. Not all of them are the same. Okay, some are better at it, so smart weeds, polygonum species, not as good at picking up nitrogen than, say, pigweed and lamb squatters. Okay? Again, I'm trying to hammer the point that, boy, fertility management is really, really important. And if you mishandle that, okay, just like some of you know, you know, if you have vegetable gardens or, you know, you've worked in crop production, you provide too much nitrogen, you're just going to get foliage. You're not going to get much in terms of fruits, okay, or, or the marketable um, fruits that, that you get from some of the vegetables. So, uh, and, and apart from, you know, nitrogen being so expensive now, that, that's an issue. Again, I would not ask you, please tell me which the, you know, what species and what, you know, percentage composition of dry biomass does lamb squatters have. I mean, that's not the goal, but the idea of, boy, yeah, they certainly are better competitors for certain of these, of these compounds, okay? This is saying the same thing. Okay, it's basically looking at corn when it's grown alone. This is the nitrogen percentage, okay, in young and mature plants of corn. Look at that, 3.78, 1.44. Look when corn grows with weeds. Both of them drop, and these are significant differences. Okay, look at lamb squatters, okay, when grown alone. Certainly, they get hit as well when they grow alone, but boy, they can still maintain their, you know, their, their percentage. They're much better competitors at this. Look at the pigweeds. 436 when grown alone, 406. I mean, there's a bit of a drop. I mean, corn is competing also. I mean, it's not like it's just sitting there. But nonetheless, look at these, these, these percentages. And now we always talk about pigweed being a, a real problem species. It's one of the species you could certainly, for livestock, you could get nitrate poisoning because of its luxurious storage of, of nitrogen, more than it needs for growth. Okay? It basically stores it, even though it doesn't need it. Basically, it's, it's what we would call a competitive effect. It's grabbing the resources so that it doesn't make it available to its competitor, which could be a corn plant or another weed, but doesn't need all of it. That's, it, it basically hoards it, which is really, you know, and of course, an animal consumes that. You've got livestock eating those plants that are high nitrate, and we have seen nitrate poisonings. Talked to a few of the folks in animal science, and they've talked about that being a problem. Okay? Again, very, very similar to what I had shown before. The ability of these weeds to, to take up nutrients in, in large amounts and even, even when competing with corn plants, they're by far more competitive. Okay? So, here's the question for you. You think, wow, man, you know, I want to increase my yields. Let's just fertilize. Let's just fertilize. You think that's going to be the solution? Oh, let's just pump the nutrients in there. Here's a, an, an experiment where they were looking at wheat that was grown with wild oats, Avena fatua, okay, at three levels of fertilization. This is, you know, field, field type experiment, okay. Wheat yield with pre plant nitrogen, 0, 67, 134 kilograms per hectare, okay, of, okay, of nitrogen. And here are the densities. So when you, when you basically grow the wheat without any weeds, what we call weed free, here's your yield, okay. 6,990, okay? You, keep, you fertilize, it's 7,520. You fertilize, 7,650, okay? There's your average. So certainly there is an increase. If you have no weeds, that N1, N2, N3, you're certainly increasing bias. Now you start getting weeds in there, okay? So this is now dropping from 6,990 to 6,430. Okay, you say, well, I'm going to make it up by fertilizing, okay? Here it goes, okay? Basically just levels out. It has increased, but levels out. Going from 67 to 134, 
It's not doing much. You're wasting money. Okay? Uh, eight, or even let's go to the extreme, 32 plants. Okay? Certainly 32 plants, and you don't fertilize at all, you get 5,400. So you say, oh, man, let me fertilize so that I, you know, my wheat's going to take up the nutrients and increase the, the, especially with this high density. Look what happens. Okay? 41, 34, it keeps dropping. You're increasing, okay, doubling your fertilizer, and the yields keep decreasing. What's happening? Why am I getting this? I thought I was supposed to fertilize. I was supposed to increase. I want to see this go up to 558, 6,000. Why is it decreasing? What's happening? If I show you this on the prelim, in your own words, explain to me what the, the trends, what's going on, and explain it in any of the principles you've learned in class, what would you say? It looks like the oats are better at getting the nitrogen than the wheat is. So when you add the nitrogen, the oats expand, and then they get even better at getting nitrogen. So basically it's telling you that wild oat is a much better competitor for nitrogen than your, than your wheat, in this case, at these levels. Okay? Now, the other interesting thing is, take a look on average, as you increase fertilization, okay, First of all, let's look at this, okay? As we increase density, here's the average, okay? No, okay, the average across all. You basically have a decrease, which makes sense, okay? On average, you're getting a decrease as you're increasing the density of votes. Makes sense, the, you know, they're, they're gonna. But what's also interesting is that you're getting a decrease in yield of wheat as you increase fertility, okay? So both density, and so what, what this is saying is you can't just make this up by fertilizing. If you have weeds present, if you, do, if you do a good job of keeping your weeds out, that's what this is showing, okay? No weeds, nice increase, okay? That's why we have some growers say, hey, I, I need to have my field clean. I can't afford to have, and, you know, this is often true of our conventional growers. They say, no, I want to see no weed in there because I know that they can take up nutrients, they can put in seeds in the weed seed bank, okay? Kyle, did you have a... I, I've been watching in a study they've done an oat yield, a wild oat yield, which is interesting to watch. Yeah, it's, it, would have been, it would have been interesting. Uh, it, you basically, and I'll show you one way you could do this, as how you can measure this kind of stuff with what's called a replacement series experiment. And you would see this. You would see the oat coming down, and guess who's going up? The wild oats. Okay, the wheat, sorry. Wheat and wild oats. So, yeah, it would have been nice. They probably had the data, but they didn't. I didn't pull it out for this. Yes? When you're talking about weeds that hoard nitrogen more than they need it, when, the, I mean, when you fertilize a crop, you harvest the crop and you're obviously taking a lot of the nitrogen with your, your forage or more right. your harvest. And so you need to fertilize again. But with weeds, when they get tilled under, does that nitrogen again get released back in the soil? And does that have a buildup? Is that going to make like a domino effect for the right. you know, as a basically steroids for the rest of the weed bank? Or? Right. It's a good question. Uh, the nitrogen is definitely released if the plants are young. Uh, you typically see that. Uh, the, the problem is that you will, the plants, the, the crop will take up some of that nitrogen that's going to be released. Uh, but uh, often uh, by then, well, if you do it, there is a bit of a spike. But it's, it's, what it does also, it stimulates germination of other weed seeds in the seed bank. Uh, as you're, 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 you're cultivating. Uh, but that may not be a bad thing if you're going to be controlling. So to answer your question, yeah, and some people actually use weeds as kind of for composting. If they, haven't, they don't have rhizomes you know, for annual weeds, that's not a bad thing actually to till them under and they become you know, nice organic matter. And there is a bit of a flush, but it's not that, that high. So you know, somebody says, wow, I've got all this red root pigweed. Can I just plow that under and get a nice flush of, of nitrogen? You probably do. Uh, but, you know, a lot of it is still bound, and, and, and certainly if you get rains, it could be easily leached out. That's the problem with nitrogen, particularly if the, if the crop isn't, you know, doesn't have enough of a root biomass to be able to pull it in, okay? But to answer your question, yeah, and some people have actually advocated using, you know, weeds as a source of nitrogen in some cases, especially those that hoard it. Rob, did you have a question? Uh, maybe just seeking a confirmation. In intercropping, then, there can be these competitive factors as well. And so while you're doing it for sustainability reasons or erosion or considerations like that, you could actually be hurting your crop. Right? Absolutely. And we'll talk about that when I get into cultural control and we talk about intercropping. I will show you an index 
that you need to keep in mind. So not all intercrops are great. You need to really team up the right crops together because of this. You put in a, a crop that's an extreme you know, competitor for nitrogen, um, you might have issues. And that's why you'll go with a legume and a grass. So you, you, you kind of have to team them up. You certainly don't want to put two intercrops, one that's an alternate host for a pathogen of the other crop. Uh, so, and we'll talk about it. You want crops that what we call niche differentiation. They each take, maybe take nutrients uh, at different times of the year, at different depths. So you, you need to know the biology of each of the crops. So, and, and I'll give you an example of, of a failed intercrop when I was doing some graduate work between, uh, I think it was uh, romaine lettuce and uh, peas, I think. Romaine lettuce, peas, or, or bell peppers. And it was disastrous. Uh, I was looking at another grad student helping him out, and they were looking at that, and then you realize, boy, this is not a good intercrop, just because the lettuce looked, with the peppers, they, it looked rough. They just, the peppers just took it, everything. So, yeah, this is a good question. And so we'll talk about that, the implications of this. But that's, that's an important question, fertilization regime. The other thing is, in intercrops, you could be, you've got, you may want to fertilize, but you might also have a legume in there, and you, of course you know that Particularly, nitrogen fertilization will inhibit nodulation, you know? And so, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, they, they, they'll intercrop, let's say, millet with uh, cowpea, which is a legume. And they need to be really careful about, you know, fertilization because if you, you, you provide too much nitrogen, you will basically stop the, the nodules. Uh, why should the plant that's got enough nitrogen, why should it fix atmospheric nitrogen? So. Yeah, the, the, the teaming up, it's a science. There's no question about it, and, and we'll talk more about that, okay? So this is just a, a summary. Yields decreased with N and weak density. So both, both, you know, with uh, nitrogen, okay, going this way, and with density. So obviously the worst case scenario, look at the lowest, okay? You've spent all this money for fertilizer, and you've got major weeds, okay? In some ways you're better off not fertilizing. That's what it's in. You're better off not fertilizing. Does anybody know why you're better off not fertilizing? What do you get this? You still have 32 plants. Why do you get such a low relative to the fertilization of the wheat? How do you explain this? Same number of plants, same territory, you fertilize, and the wheat gets hammered. You don't fertilize, and I would say, man, don't fertilize. Well, because the wild oat is a better competitor for nitrogen, you're just... As you're adding more nitrogen, you're just increasing the vigor of the weed. Exactly. Okay? So that's why more is not always better. If you don't understand the dynamics, no. You, you would hope that a grower wouldn't be in this situation, but sometimes I've seen, I've been with growers, man, the weeds got away from me. I couldn't get in because it was wet, I couldn't get my equipment in. Uh, I put down a pre emergent herbicide, it rained, washed the thing out, or it's been dry for two weeks, it doesn't work. Because a lot of the uh, pre-emergent herbicides need, need uh, moisture for activation, some rainfall, at least within the first 10 days. And so what happens is then, oh, I'm going to fertilize, I'm going to give the, the crop a boost. And they do this, and this is what happens. And I tell them, don't do it, don't waste your money. You know, in some situations, they, it might be, if anything, what I would do is, if anything, I would I'd tell them to side dress, go, go right next or bam. Put it where the, the crop is going to get it, don't put it where the weeds are going to get it. Okay? So... Again, the term asymmetric. Nitrogen is asymmetrically favored. Okay? So nitrogen, the weeds are taking it up much better than the crop is, in this case wheat. Okay? Weeds have a higher nutrient use efficiency. Okay? Nit or in this case could be also nitrogen use efficiency than the crop. It's not always true, but in most cases weeds have been selected for this. Okay? So very, very important to keep that in mind. Okay, some of you might ask the question, does it matter what type of nitrogen I get? If I'm using nitrate, is that a, is that a big deal? Or maybe if I, I use ammonium, that, that, do they differentiate? Is that, you know, which one might be more available where? This is one example using redwood pigweed. This is maize, shoot biomass, and that supplied us nitrate, and O3, okay, and ammonium. For corn, it doesn't matter. They, they can take care of both. But look at the weeds. You supply this nitrate, the pig weeds go crazy. They can really take it. Okay? And these were not planted in competition. They were planted alone. So you could imagine if I was having a, had some pig weed in with my corn and I used nitrate, nice big shot of nitrate, guess who's going to pick up the nitrate? 
pigweed was not as good at picking up ammonia. So if I had to, you know, give some advice to a grower and they're fertilizing, ideally I'll say, look, your corn doesn't really matter. It can handle both. But boy, if you've got pigweed, I think the better way to go is, is maybe to supply your nitrogen as ammonia. Okay? Yes? Oh, uh, good question. I was trying to look that up, actually. Um, the experience that we have had, and I had a postdoc that worked with me on, on uh, not with retroflexes, with uh, poeli, and we saw the same thing. Uh, so that's a good question. I don't know offhand. Does anybody know has had experience with... Um, it might be. I mean, again, you know, often, you know, nitrate is more easily available for, for a number of most plants. I mean, corn is a good example. It would be nice to test this out. And I'm sure there's the literature. I could look it up. There's been some nice studies that look at the form of nitrogen for a, a range of weeds. Um, if you're interested, you want to Google uh, the, the main researcher that's done this kind of stuff is somebody called uh, Robert Blackshaw up in Canada, in Western Canada. He's done a lot of work. If you want to know for different species, the different forms of nitrogen, so it's a Blackshaw, Robert E. Blackshaw. Just Google it or go to Web of Science and see, and, and, and he's done a lot of fertility work. But again, here was the idea that, hey, you know, don't assume that even, you know, for nitrogen, any form is equal. It's not equal. And it might, it actually varies with species. Not all species show this. I put pigweed because it's such a classic. And that's why people are interested in working with this piece. The other thing I should say is that it's also stimulated to germinate much better when you provide nitrogen as nitrate. And we've done some studies here at Caldwell where uh, you saw Stephanie's project. We had a three-year study where we did that. And we actually supplied different, uh, different times. We did split applications, you know, thinking, why should we provide it all at once? Maybe we'll, we'll stagger split applications. And we saw, you know, some dramatic differences as well. Okay, now I'll, I'll say something about that. So, okay, here's, so the question is, does it matter what type of nitrogen goes on or nutrient? Yes, for some species. Does it matter when it goes on, i.e. at the beginning, at the end of the season? Should we split the applications? It's because, you know, if weeds are much better picking it up and we give them a one-shot amount, then we're, we're bolstering the, the weeds, not the crop. So what this is showing you is, um, this is Veronica. It's a speed weld, okay, heterofolia. It's a speed weld kind of like almost brown ivy looking weed. This is the weed, and what they have here is the biomass of the weed. And here's the fertilizer treatments. And what they're looking at, okay, they're trying to, trying to look at what, what would happen if we would apply 140 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, but we split it over three dates. It's, so it's split applications, giving, okay, instead of one big boost, well, this plant does actually quite well, okay? And I'll say a little more. What happens if we apply the nitrogen at tillering, okay? And here's tillering. Nah, that's not, not that good, too. Even 60 kilograms of tillering, you, the, you know, the taller the bars, this is the worst is your weed situation. Remember, that's a weed. We're not growing it as a crop here. So what, what we're saying is that this kind of nutrient regime or timing increase or decrease the biomass of this weed. Of course, we want to see that decrease. Okay, where we see a decrease is 60 kilograms applied at stem elongation. Okay, and I forgot, I'm trying to remember if that, what crop we were growing here. Oh, jeez. I'm trying to think if it was wheat. It might have been wheat. Okay, so they applied it at, at tillering. Not, that doesn't matter, but at stem elongation, that worked. And where they applied no nitrogen, which is not really a good thing to do. Okay, you'd still need some nitrogen. Okay, the... Uh, that's where we had the lowest impact, okay, or at least the best results in terms of weed control, okay? Again, what I'm trying to get at here is not necessarily specifically what's happening here. For example, I'll give you one where we, didn't, we saw the opposite. For when we did our work with, with Powell Amaranth, if we split our applications over the season, a little bit, you know, half of it at the beginning, then, you know, mid-season to to the uh, poeli or to the, to the weed, that's when the crop did the best. If we applied it in one shot nitrate at the beginning of the season, or even if we kind of side dressed, the weeds did a lot better. So splitting it up kind of gives a chance to the crop. It doesn't give this major boost to the weeds, but it uh, allows the crop hopefully to get some of that, okay? 
So very often, split applications are much better than, you know, from a weeds perspective, from a management perspective, it's a pain in the butt. Because you, you don't want to, you've got 10,000 other things to do that you have to go and, you know, already, you know, side dressing is, you have to get there, you know, in June and have to do it. But from a weeds perspective, that's the way to go, okay? So delaying and reduced weed growth, but did not reduce weed yield. So it wasn't wheat, okay? So delaying it. The more you delayed it, which is, you know, N3 here, stem elongation. So tillering just means, you know, the wheat when you're getting the little shoots off the bottom. But when these were elongated, which is a little later in the season, um, that really dropped the weeds down, okay? But it helped your wheat at that time. The, this weed was not that competitive later on. Early on, you would have stimulated it, okay? So you really need to see what species you're dealing with, okay? Uh, now, you might say, geez, we might as well not have applied anything, okay? Because look at that, the, okay? The, uh, what you don't see here is the, the wheat yields. In this case, the wheat yields did go down if you didn't fertilize, okay? So you had these weeds and you didn't fertilize, it caused you grief. So you need to, you need to fertilize. But what they're saying is if you were going to fertilize, do it later, okay? Of course, now you might say, well, geez, some of our crops need it early. You know, that's when we got to give them the boost. But let me tell you this. Do you guys recognize that most of our crop seeds, and I think I might have mentioned this, are a factor of 10 or 20 times bigger than any of our weed seeds. And so they could really handle early growth. We can have corn, you know, six to eight inches, you know, at the, you know, two, three leaf stage, easily four leaf stage without having to apply any nitrogen. It's got enough in its reserves. Whereas our weeds are so tiny, they have to depend on us on getting whatever fertilizers out there. So very often, you know, we're not taking advantage of the seed size difference of our major crops, corn and soybean, be perfect examples, less so for maybe for cereals. But we're not, we don't take advantage of that. What do we do? We go and broadcast. You know, we put in a, you know, a fertilizer across the, oh, just to make sure everybody gets it. Well, you know who everybody is? It's your weeds. And so, you know, we need to rethink that. That's why banding is probably much better, okay? Or holding off fertilization a little later, okay? Now, how will it vary? When to apply the, um, the nitrogen, or, or it, it will depend on the emergence and life cycle of the weed relative to the crop, okay? Here's a quick, here's a question for you. What do you think is more important in terms of reducing your yield of a crop? The time, the relative emergence time of your weed relative to your crop, or the distance that the weed is from your crop, okay? I'm going to repeat this. This is an important concept here. What is going to cause you the greatest yield reduction? Okay, a weed that emerges at about the same time as your crop, is that more important than a weed, the distance that the weed is relative to your crop? I.e., if the weed is very next to your crop, that's actually more important than when the, that weed emerges. Which one of these is more important in general? You would think, just from your own experiences, or just give, give it a shot. Yeah. Timing of emergence. Who agrees? Who disagrees that, hey, it's where you, where you are? In general, the first group is correct. It is much more, and we'll show you. Um, not that distance doesn't matter. I mean, clearly, you're a foot away from the crop row. You're going to have less of an impact if you're you know, an inch away. But timing is going to be critical. Any weed that emerges before your crop and you don't destroy it, or at the same time, or it's going to cause you major, major reductions if you don't take care of them. Uh, relative to a weed that's an inch away from you, but germinates or emerges, I should say, uh, you know, six days after your crop emerges. Because your crop might have had time, unless it's a real wimpish type crop that hasn't, is not competitive, okay? So if somebody gives you the choice, should I worry about the weed that's an inch from my crop but will emerge in a week after my crop does, or should I worry about the weed that may be, you know, six inches away from the crop but will emerge, you know, has emerged already and will emerge at the same time as my corn or soybeans or favorable species, you worry about emergence time. Very, very important. And I'll show you some examples. Okay? What's also important, so it's not only the type of nutrients. Remember, we're, we're talking about nutrients and how they affect competition. Not just the, the timing, okay? Uh, the type of nutrient, the timing, but where, spatially, where you put that, that nutrient or that nitrogen 
is going to be important. And this is where I'm referring. There's a study by Yi Tomaso. This is my colleague, the former Cornell professor that, that uh, is a, a co-author of The Weeds of the Northeast, Joe Di Tomaso. He published this really neat paper in Weed Science in 95, looking to see if anybody's interested in fertilization and how we could use strategies of fertilization to, to, to increase crop production, but you could apply it to many systems. So Rob, maybe in turf, he, he wrote some nice work showing you know, timing is important, but also how you apply the, the product. Where do you apply it? And they basically, in, in, in reviewing many studies, okay, if you put, you ban the fertilizer, usually, you know, 15, 15 inch swath, much better than broadcast. No question about it. In fact, you're putting it where the crop needs it. And what you have to do is take advantage, okay, of the depth of the crop seed. Usually, in some many cases, the crop seed could be deeper than most of our weed seeds. So put the fertilizer out of the zone of where your weeds are going to be, okay? A little deeper, okay? We do this. We take advantage of this sowing depth. Most of our weeds are tiny seeds, remember, and they're going to germinate. They're within the first half inch, inch. Usually, okay, our crops, most of our bigger seed of crops, can, the beans, soybeans, and corn can go deep. Okay? We take advantage of that for herbicides as well. We have a herbicide called pendimethalin, pendulum, or prowl, that can actually be a little problematic for corn. How do we take care of it? It's a great herbicide. We plant the corn at two-inch depth so that it's out of the zone as much as possible of, of the pendimethalin. And you'll see this, we'll talk about this in class, you know, when we cover herbicides. But we're taking advantage of planting depth to make sure that the, you know, the herbicide doesn't hurt our crop. Well, what I'm saying here is if you could put the, take advantage of the different differential depth of our weed seeds, which are within the first half inch, inch, and usually our crops are a little deeper, put the fertilizer deeper so that the crop takes it to the, and not the weeds. And that, you know, again, you could take advantage of that. Of course, that's going to depend on soil fertility. If you, you're in a site that's very fertile to start with, and it's, you know, the, the weed seeds are within your first inch, they're going to go after those nutrients. I mean, that's just, you know. But if you can manage this, this, this would be one way to take advantage. So the type of nutrient that you're applying, when you apply it, and spatially where you apply it are all going to be important. And it's all things you need to think about. If you want to kind of better manage weeds, or, and, and again, depending on your system, you should all be thinking about that, okay? So weeds can, re so kind of a summary for nitrogen then, weeds can reduce yields by limiting nutrient acquisition by the crop, okay? If that's, these are the take home messages. Weeds often have greater response to nutrients, so increasing fertilizer rates does not help in many cases. Don't try to solve the problem by just, oh, I'm gonna overcompensate, doesn't work. It's worse. Not only are you leaching nutrients, contaminating the water table, you're spending money, throwing money out the window. Okay. Now, if you don't have any weeds, that's a good sign. That's then you know you, it's worth. And again, timing, form, and placement, very, very important. And, and, and in some cases, I can't give you specific because it's very species specific in some cases. But that information is available. You should be thinking about your own system. Geez, I'm growing corn. I've got ragweed, common ragweed. Geez, let me learn a little more about ragweed in terms of its nutrients up nutrient uptake and stuff. And that will help you better manage the plant. You know, when do I put the compost? A lot of our organic farmers, that's, they have to do this. But they don't have herbicides. They, they can cultivate, but often they're trying, am I going to be putting on too much? If I'm putting compost, am I going to get a flush? Usually when we apply inorganic fertilizer, we get this major pulse, okay, of nutrients to the crop and weeds. If you use, our, you know, composts generally or green manures, not that you don't get pulses, but the release is gradual. So it's in spurts. And that is much more favorable to keeping weeds at bay and providing some of the nutrients to your crop than this inorganic fertilizer that's not slow. So if you get inorganic slow releasing fertilizer, that's where I, what I would favor from a weed perspective. Again, the grower's got to think of many other things than just the, the weeds. But from the weed perspective, I'd rather see a slow release type fertilizer if you're using an organic. Otherwise, if you're using organic composts, green manures, okay, they tend to, to slowly release nutrients. So that's, that's an important concept. Okay? So a couple of things about um, the nature of competition. I think all of you pretty well know what interspecific competition is. Okay? Competition between individuals, same species. So you can have interspecific competition. And interspecific, competition between individuals of two or more species. So I could have corn and velvet leaf. I could have velvet leaf and ragweed. 
That is interspecific competition, okay? And what this is saying is competition is a major driver for selection or evolution when species use the same resource, okay? Weeds and crops are using the same resources. They're all going to go for nitrogen. They're all going to go for water. They're all going to want light, a good number of them. They may vary in their competitive ability. This is referred to as niche overlap. A niche is the, the little microclimate that each species, the little corner in, in the world that each of these plants has, okay? So, and this is in your notes, I call this, there's something called the Gauss's Exclusion Principle. G-A-U-S-E-S, -E -S, Gauss's Exclusion Principle, okay? Which states, and listen to this, if I have two species that are competing for the same resource, over time, selection should favor one of the species and basically the other species is gone. So you'll have the dominance of one species and usually the others, or if they're not, if they don't go extinct, they're close to it, okay? That's what Goss is, that's why they call it exclusion, it excludes. And Goss was a microbiologist that did work with, with uh, microorganisms, bacteria, okay? And then postulated, this is what happens, this is what should happen, okay? The question I have for you is, and again, you have this in the notes, is if this is true, why do when I go in an old field, if I just step outside here, we go to Caldwell and I'll see an old field, I bet you I can count 35 to 50 plants different plants in there. Where's this principle coming from? That if, why isn't there one dominant plant that outcompetes everything? We do have some cases of invasive species doing that, but it's not as, you know, uh, as, as frequent an occurrence as gods would have us think with this exclusion principle. Okay? These plants are all competing for the same. How come we get such diversity? Why don't we have just one species dominating? Because each plant is Excellent. Is that where you're going to get? Yeah, yeah, basically, his experience were probably done in a homogenous environment, while soil varies over that expanse, and so things are going to compete differently in different microclimates. Right. That says that you don't have this homogeneity. You also, so you can you can think of this as being both temporal and spatial. Temporal being, I could have a plant that uh, does a good job of getting nutrients early in the season. I have another one that's much better mid-season, later in the season. So they're, they're separating out, their niches are different temporally, time -wise. We could have them spatially, we have, and we have this. We have some plants that the root mass is right at the surface, they do really well at capturing water and nutrients, okay? In shallow, shallow depths, we have others that have deep roots can go. So they, to us, they may go, they're competing for water, but they're competing at different depths, at different spatial scales. So that is, and then, uh, in fact, in the notes, I mentioned this, um, uh, what are I, uh, a competitive equivalence, I don't know how I phrased it, but by Lonnie Arson. Arson was my, he's a plant ecologist, he was my major professor when I did my master's degree up at, in Queens, Queens University in Kingston, Ontario, right across from the lake. Uh, and uh, he proposed in a classic paper in American Naturalist in, in 1989, I think, um, this, this, this idea that the reason we don't have just one species dominating in many habitats which you, you would have thought would be the case if this, you know, niche overlap and these guys competing for the same resource is that, just as you mentioned, not all species are equivalent. One might have large leaves and be good at capturing light. Another might have a large root mass and be able to get nutrients. So it's equivalent bound. When you add up all the attributes, okay, it, it, at the end of the day, it evens out. Just like, for example, in this class, some of you are really good at memorization. Okay, you're going to be good at getting, you're probably going to get a top grade in the weed ID part. But if you have to do a written project, perhaps, where you, you, know, you need to, to bring things together, synthesize, 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 synthesize man, I can't even pronounce it, um, to, to, to bring it all together and to integrate, you might not be as good at doing that. Okay? And so at the end of the day, you both might get, you know, the two students might get an A in the course, but one has by far did much better in, in the memorization in remembering things, and the other is much better, needs quiet time to integrate, just, you know, needs to think it through. And, of course, then you have those who are really good at both, competitive effect, competitive response, and they're really dominant. And that's what we see in some invasive species. But it's not across the uh, all flora, okay? So 
That's, just be aware of that, kind of the, the underpinnings of this. And there's that definition of competitive effect and response. So I'm kind of jumping around a bit, but I uh, just wanted to, to be sure that you, so if on the prelim I ask you to differentiate this and you know, tell me in your own words what it means, I hope you can, okay? Um, you have this in your notes. This is just basically showing what are some of these key attributes and, and that allow a plant to be competitive. And no one single plant is good at all of these, okay? Uh, some are really good, have rapid seedling growth. Now, the ideal weed and maybe some of our invasives have a lot of these characteristics. That's why it makes them so problematic, okay? So, you know, they synchronize germination. They come up, up together. They have very rapid seedling growth, okay? Uh, they, they tolerate and, uh, shading, rapid response to nutrients. You put the nutrients, they're really fast growing, okay? Rapid vertical growth. So these are all key characteristics. Okay? And again, just be aware of them. And, you know, if I were to tell you, you know, if you had to, to, to create the ideal weed, what would be some of the, the attributes or, or traits that you would like to breed into these plants? Think of some of these characteristics. Think about, you know, what you've learned in terms of what would make a good competitor. And maybe think about some of our invasive species. What is it about these plants that are so good? Man, they reproduce vegetatively. They produce tons of seeds. They can tolerate harsh conditions that no other plants can. All of those come into play, and that's what this is referring to, okay? So, this is getting back to timing of emergence. Very important concept. That's when, I, you know, when we say timing is everything, and I don't know if it's going to be next week or the week after. I'll show you a video for those of you into machinery, okay? It's uh, machinery for vegetable growers the different types of machinery, and the one thing that many of these growers, so it's, it's basically testimonials of, each, of many, a number of growers in the Northeast that grow vegetables uh, as to you know, how important their tillage machinery is. So you get to see some of this machinery if you're not familiar with it. But the dominant thing they're going to talk about is timing is everything. Timing. Timing you know, your cultivation, timing your herbicide relative to the emergence of your crop and your weed. Okay. So this is very, very important, okay? Earlier emergent plants are much more competitive because they are, as you know, they're quick at obtaining nutrients. Now, you could, you could knock them off before you plant. Remember that stale seed bed type thing where you stimulate germination? Let them, let them come and then clean them out, then put your crop. But if they emerge at the same time, you're going to be in trouble, okay? So here's a simple experiment, okay, a diagrammatic experiment that shows this, and I think you should have that little diagram, okay? What they did here is they had a number um, of plants, okay? Uh, I believe it was the same species, but they had seeds in different positions, okay? And they basically, these seeds germinated and emerged at different times, okay, in a given area. So here's seed number one, seed number two of this given species, and this is just hypothetical, but it's, it's been shown to be true, okay? So here are the positions. After four days, and, and the seeds germinate based on their number. So, you know, one was the earliest germinating, and two, three, and four. So four days after you plant these guys, these are the guys that have emerged, and the area that they occupy, the space that they occupy, is shown by, you know, the size of the circle. So here, they just got started. Eight days later, look at number one. It's starting to expand, take over space. So, Rob, you know, when we talked about, you know, don't space is important, it's competed for it. Well, in a sense it is, because they're, they're going to cover this area and not allow other species to come in. But look at species one, two, okay, three and four, and now five, six, seven, okay, five, six, seven, and eight have come up, and, and then, you know, nine and ten. But let's look at after 20 days, okay? Does it matter when you came up? Yeah, it matters. Look at the area that they dominate seed number one the first one that emerged look at the size of its polygon or area of influence here's number two here's number three four five look at the late germinating or late emerging species okay or I individuals i should say the same species number 10 look at the area of influence number two is already dominated it's already taken over and you see this you see one or two big weeds and then you see these little guys same species maybe trying to get you know poke their heads out this is showing you and, and basically telling you that 
the emergence timing is critical. Many of you already know that, and growers know that, oh man, if it emerges at the same time, I'm in trouble, okay? That's why we say that, hey, don't worry as much if you have something emerging, you know, a weed two weeks after your crop is up. I'm not saying don't worry about it completely. Depending on the competitiveness of your crop and the weed, it may not be such an issue, okay? Because the crop is dominating. It's going to cover it up. The weeds will be there. They're not necessarily going to die, but they're going to be at this size, and many may not even make it to, to flowering and producing seed, although some do, okay? So emergence, the timing, is more important than exactly where you are. Okay, those that get there first are going to dominate, simple, okay, and we see this over and over again, no matter how competitive you are, okay. To highlight this, I just want to show you, okay, some work that was done with lamb squatters on yield of sugar beets, okay, and here's the density of the weeds, okay, of the lamb squatters, here's the em emergence, weed emergence days after the crop, the sugar beets came out, okay. When basically your weeds came out at the same time as your crop, okay, after the growing season, at this density, 5.5 plants per meter square, you had an almost 80% yield reduction in sugar beets. And this is disaster, man. No grow would ever want it. Just to give you an idea, most growers will not tolerate more than a 5% yield reduction over a weed-free situation, okay? So 79% is disaster, okay? That's because the crop and the weed emerged at the same time. And this is assuming you do nothing. I mean, okay? Same density, but now the weeds emerge 10 days later. 10 days after your crop emerges, you're down to 37% yield reduction, i.e. your crop has had a chance to start to dominate. And of course, the more competitive your crop is, the better it's going to be at keeping the weeds, suppressing the weeds. That's why we work with plant breeders that try to breed some competitiveness and get these plants to produce lots of leaves early on to shade suppress the weeds, okay? Even at a much higher weed density, but three weeks after, the weeds emerge at a much higher density, but three weeks after the crop, only a 7% yield reduction. I think all of us know that. So when is it time to, to weed? It's usually early on, if the weeds emerge at the same time as your crop, okay? The question that I have for you is, do you ever get in a situation where, okay, here's assuming that you have the crop and the weed emerging at the same time, and this is going to lead to a way that you measure competition, and when you need to get in there and do something, either put it down a herbicide, cultivate, flame weed, you name it. The weed emerges at the same time as your crop, okay, you're going to have to have some window. How long, the question you're going to have as a grower is, how long can I keep the weeds in there? Uh, before I need to do something, otherwise I'm going to have more than a 5 or 10% yield reduction. We do that very often. Even in Roundup Ready systems, the grower is thinking, geez, I know I could wipe out all the weeds because, you know, I, I have my soybean, but how long can, you know, what size do these weeds have to, what's the maximum I can allow them to grow in my soybeans before there's going to be major weed competition and no matter if I spray Roundup and knock off the weeds, they've already done their damage. Do you see what I mean? That's a very important question. The, to turn that around is we have growers that will keep their, weed, their, their fields clean at the beginning. So the, they start off with the crop and a weed free, okay, they've got some pre-emergent herbicide or they spray. But what happens is the crop is growing but now you start getting some weeds coming back. Either the, the residual activity wears off or they cultivate and a new weed, a new flush come up. The question they'll have is, okay, how long do I have to keep my weed, my crop, Free of weeds, what's that time period? How many weeks before such that if weeds come in afterwards, they're not going to reduce the yields of my crop? Do you see the two ends of it? So the, the, the grower that's going to have weeds starting, maybe they, they're thinking, I'm going to have Roundup, I can wait. But they're going to ask, oh, you know, how long? And what happens if it gets wet and they can't get in and spray? What's their maximum? And we'll talk about that. So that period, that the, we call that the weed-free period. The weed-free period and the period of competition, how long can the, the crop and the weed be together before you get a real reduction. The overlap between these two periods gives you what is referred to as the critical period of competition. And I'll, I'll show you graphically what that looks like. That is the window, usually in weeks or size of the crop, you know, that between the eight leaf stage and 15 leaf stage, when you, the grower, must get in there and do whatever, you know, 
control method, if you're an organic grower, obviously you're not going to use herbicides, but maybe you need to go into a flame weed, you need to, to cultivate, or if you're using herbicides, that's the time to do it, okay? And it's going to be based on this, okay? So, and I'll, I'll get there in a second. I just, I've, I've sown the seed now, now you guys are going to be thinking about it. So, what happens when we increase the density, okay, of a given area? We've got a crop and a weed, or we got, you know, monoculture, of, and we talked about this. We got a monoculture of a weed. What, what will happen? What are a couple of things that are going to happen when, and these are what we call density dependent factors in, in plant, plant growth or plant population. I've got 100 plants. Okay, remember we started talking about that? What are two things that can happen as I increase my density? I go from 5 plants per flat to 50 to 100. What are a couple of things I'm going to see that are density dependent? I'm going to see. Death, remember we talked about self-thinning? There's this rule that things will die out and a few large ones will make it to reproduction. The other is you're going to get increased plasticity. What, what do I mean by this? What's plasticity? Um, the population will be able to respond to uh, changing environmental conditions. Okay, and what, what could be one of these changes? That so let's say there's a population of 100 plants and there's a drought. And because there's more, more genetic diversity, there, maybe 25 or Right. So plants will adapt their phenology or their morphology based on this. So what you'll we'll see is in high densities, you'll get a lot of small individuals. Okay? Just like we saw with that lamp squirter pot experiment, you know. You put five plants per pot. Yeah, the biomass stays the same, but they're all little individuals. So they're changing their, you know, morphology. From being, and velvet leaf is a good example. I've always given you this example. Velvet leaf is a great competitor for light. But in soybeans, it'll just be four or five feet tall, just above the crop canopy. In corn, it'll be 12 feet, just over it. That is plasticity in height. Height is the parameter that's changing here. Okay? That happens, and, and, and this happens for, so you all see maple trees that are growing in your front yard by themselves. What is it? One plant? Huge, right? What happens when you go in a forest? in a woodlot, and you've got many of the maples together, don't you get them being thin, which is nice for wood, but you get these almost like stilt-like plants, because they're competing. That is plasticity. And some of them might, and I'm saying that some of them might die off, might die off, might die off due to uh, self-thinning, this rule. Okay? Steve, did you have a question? My question was, uh, whether, when, when you say you see increased plasticity, I wasn't sure if that was just something you see as an overall, because the chances <laughs> Right, there is, there is that, and so, right, and then also the response, they're plastic in responding to death. Remember the, the uh, petunia, you know, example I give you, that you're growing 100 plants, and if I go six weeks after, I'm down to 50 plants. Um, they were all small, the small, some of the small guys have died, but there's the, the survivors are getting bigger and bigger, okay? That also happens. The survivors go by the way, as, as the plants die, the survivors take up more of the nutrients that are made available. And they become, and so there's the skewness, asymmetric distribution. You have relatively few individuals that are big and a lot of little guys. Okay? Think about the U.S. We've got how many billionaires? Relatively few. But man, you look at what their combined income is and get all the rest of us, except for some of you I know are very wealthy. You've got, we're all down here. And we, don't, we make up maybe, you know, 10% of what some of those, you know, Buffets and, and Gates are able to bring in, okay? I'm just saying that there's that kind of asymmetric distribution and then, you know, kind of the middle class is on the way down, okay? That's the same with this, and it's due to, to, to plasticity. So, with increasing density, do you get increased plasticity of a population or increased plasticity of individuals? You, you, get, you get both, okay? The plasticity of the population is, is, is uh, reflected in mortality, okay? And, and I'll finish with that. I'm going to show you the self-thinning rule so that you all, you all see it, okay? So, and I'm going to summarize, and I have it on an overhead, so I, I'm going to put up the overheads and, and finish off with the presentation. But what I'm saying here is, remember this law of constant final yield is represented by a larger number of small plants. So, you increase the density... Your total biomass stays the same, but the individuals are getting small. So as the population is, individuals are dying, okay, you, do, you have a lot. Not everybody's large because there aren't enough resources, okay? 
Yield can be represented in different plant parts, okay? So different plant parts. So in some cases, what I want to tell you is that if you're looking at grain yield, you may not get this nice relationship. I mean, in, in actual fact, as we increase the density, our grain yield doesn't do this. It actually slopes down as we increase the density. There's, you know, that, the reproductive part gets really hit hard by, by density, okay? Or if carrots, you know, the, 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 the tap roots that are the marketable component, I'll show you in the overhead. Usually this is for biomass, but you will see different components, different plant parts do not follow this precisely. In, in many cases, it actually dips and decreases. So it's even more to your disadvantage not to increase your densities. And yield can be, and that's the key. Yield can be shared unequally. That's what it's referred to as asymmetric competition. It's not equal sharing. Somebody's gonna get more than the other, and usually it's the weeds, okay? And this is usually the kind of relationship we see. As you increase weed density, crop yield, okay? So at low levels of weeds, okay, you know, it, it's, you get a quick decline. I mean, you really get this thing. You might say, well, geez, it's still up here, but boy, even like one or two plants, and then what happens? You get to a certain density, it doesn't matter anymore. The crop is hammered. You're down to 10% yield, okay? So don't assume, oh, if I just, and I'll show you an example. We could have, I know one of the studies, we can have one velvet leaf plant per three foot row of corn, or even, I think it's actually soybeans, and they can reduce yield 40%. If you allow that plant to stay in, apart from all the seeds that are going into the seed bank, just one plant per three foot row of, of, of soybean can cause, in the immediate plants next door, you know, and if you have it throughout the field, okay, these were some trials, different densities, you get a 40% yield reduction. So this thing, for, depending on the species and the crop, can really, this exponential drop, okay, inverse in this case, not a good thing, okay? And there, here's some examples, okay? I think you have a chart like this, and again, I won't ask you for the specifics, okay? But look at soybean. This is wild mustard, one foot row, okay? Uh, one plant per foot row, 30% yield reduction, okay? Two plants, 26, four plants, 42. This is season long, season long. You leave them there, okay? So. Uh, and you could do it, and a number of people have done this for, for other species, okay, in soybean, wheat. Some crops are much more competitive than others. I mean, that's the thing. You have weeds, that, some weeds are more competitive than other weeds. Same for crops. We have some crops that are wimps, you know, onions, carrots, these slow germinating species. You really need to have a large window. So here's the, here's the take home here. If you have things like onions and carrots, you know what the weed-free period is for many of them? How long do you have to keep that? Field, that onion field clean of weeds such that you're not going to get at least a 5% yield reduction is way more than you would get for soybean or corn. Way more. In some cases, 12 weeks, 15 weeks. And again, it is specific to the type of soil, the weather conditions, but in general, those are not competitive crops. And if you put in a nightshade in there or some competitive species, most growers will tell you, oh, no, no, the field has to be clean uh, at least for two months or a month before I could even worry, you know, if I don't want to worry about weeds, okay? And so this gives you, and again, I'll give you a, a print out of this, but this gives you an idea of, of what we call weed thresholds, is where are we gonna get mo uh, uh, at least a, what we call a weed threshold for most growers is at least a five, 10% yield reduction, okay? So what this is saying is in cereals, and this is generally speaking, okay? Oh, uh, this in this case is actually the economic threshold. What the economic threshold is, does anybody know? Just, what's the economic threshold? Um, it depends on what the market is commodity. Okay, but, but what's the definition? How am I going to define a threshold? The cost of control equals the uh, amount of loss that you incur. Right. So it's where basically the cost of control how much my herbicide, my custom applicator, what I need to pay to control that, how, you know, does that equal the increase in yield you know, that I'm going to get from, from doing it? Otherwise, if I'm losing money, I don't do it. But it's that equal cost. So at what level, what in cereals, and again, it's, I, I want more information here, and I just put that together to give you an idea of relative competitiveness, not necessarily this is exactly in my farm that I'm growing, you know, wheat, broadleaf weeds, I need 40 to 50 barnyard grass, to, to make it worthwhile, I'm, I, this is not. This is just showing you in terms of 
competitiveness, okay? But this is what the, the, tre the economic threshold is, is basically how many plants can I tolerate in there and, and, you know, and be able to, to, to carry out a, a, a control method. But what it's showing is that some, some weeds are more competitive. So, for example, in corn, uh, grass weeds, okay, broadleaf weeds can be, can be a problem. You just need five, okay, per meter square, and, and that could cause you at least a 5 or 10% yield reduction. You can tolerate grass weeds a little more. Corn can't, can, I should say. And look at in soybean, broadleaf weeds. Soybean is not very good at competing on broadleaf weeds. That's why the velvet leaves and night chase are a real problem in this crop, okay? But then again, and again, this is showing you for other crops. Look at tomatoes. Zero to five, tomatoes are not very good at competing. That, again, relative, okay? So what I want to do is, is just show you an overhead of this, uh, this whole idea of how plants, and we'll finish next week, the, the next class, the rest of this, but how weeds compete or, or, or basically die off. What is the self-thinning or Yoda's law? Okay, and I want to show you, you've got these, these hands out, handouts and these graphs, but I just didn't have it on computer, okay? Take a look at this, okay? This is the first graph I want to show you, okay? Do you guys all have this? Okay, take a look at what, okay? So what this, and I know this isn't clear here, sorry about that, I'm not sure how, this should be better. Okay, so what I want to show you here, I'll just show, we'll focus on the top one, okay? This is buckwheat, here's the initial plant density, okay? Again, not the specifics, but the general trends here, okay? We have basically 10 to the 4, 10,000, 100,000 plants, I think it's 10 to the 5, okay? Per meter square, that's a lot of plants. I mean, it's, it's estimated, you know, per meter. They did it in smaller. And what they did is, here's density of surviving plants, okay? And what they did is they planted this, this uh, buckwheat at different densities, some of them very high densities. Look at some of the densities, okay? Not all of them. This is maybe, uh, you know, 10,000 or 100,000. This is this area. That's the dot. And what they did is, after a number of days, they let the plants grow together. Remember I said if you let these guys grow over time, they're gonna, some of them are going to start dying. And I just want to show you that this is really happening. And they go back and look at the flats, and here, when they, you know, here they, they probably planted, initial density might have been about 30, here's 50, about 30. They go back, 21 days later, there's still 50. Uh, they go 35, 45, 6, 49, 63 days, there's still 50. Nothing's died. The density is not high enough for them to self-thin. That's what it's saying. Or at least they haven't competed long enough. 69 or 63 days is not long enough for number of plants to die at this density. Look what happens at about 100. Same thing. You get 100 back. So here's the initial density. This is the density of survivors. So, so far, nobody's died. After 63 days, when they had 100 plants per meter square, all of them were alive. Okay? Look at what happens as the densities increase. 1,000 plants, okay? 1,000 plants now, you're starting to get a few deaths. This is not precisely here, so it should be 10 to the 3. A 20, look at 35 days, okay? You should be right here. Now a number of plants are starting to die off. That's what it's, what it's saying. After, after, they go back after six, 49 days, more of them have died. Okay, you're not up here anymore. We should have, if they all survive, they should be up here, okay? Look after 63 days, you're down to here. All this, whatever that turns out to be, you're starting to get death. And what this is showing is the higher the density, initial density, okay, the faster things start dying, sooner, because they're interacting, they're competing with each other, okay? So look at this, okay? Uh, we're not even showing this. After 35 days at uh, whatever this at, 10,000 or you know, 30,000 plants per meter square, you certainly are not, no longer near 10 to the 4, okay? So that's what these things, after 63 days, you started off with, you know, close to 10 to the 5, and you're, you're down here, between 10 to the 2, you know, 100 and 1,000 plants. I mean, that's major death, okay? So can you all understand that, that, you know, the longer and the higher the density, you keep them together for that long, somebody's going to go. The question we're always asking, how do, how do these plants know which one should go? I mean, do they, do they communicate and say, okay, yeah, take one for the team, you, you die off, okay? And this death, this self-thinning thinning occurs at a very specific, in a very specific way. And this is the relationship. 
This is the minus 3 over 2 or minus 1 over 2, okay, relationship, okay? So take a look at this, okay? This is the initial density of the plants, okay, that survived, and this is the mean weight of survivors, okay? Y'all get that? This is a negative 1 over 2 slope, okay? Think of it this way, okay? 5 to the 3, okay, that's 5,000 plants, okay? What happens is 5,000 plants are growing together. The longer they stay together, there'll be competition. Some of them are gonna die, okay? So they get to this biomass. So the question is, how do they know when they're gonna die? Well, they follow this vertical line. What happens is these 5,000 plants all go for resources. They grow to a certain height, okay? They, re they reach this line. This is a cutoff line. They cannot go beyond this line. What has to happen is though, out of those 5,000, some plants have to die. Okay? And that's what happens. Some plants will die. And as these plants die, so you go, let's say you go from 5,000 to 1,000 plants, what happens is they were here now, the new space that is created by the death of these plants, those resources, are taken up by the survivors. That's why the mean weight of the survivors increases. Okay? So you've got 1,000 plants, they're at the, they reach, they take as many resources, they reach this line again. What happens? They start dying. If, if you allow the experiment to go on. So let's say now they're down, you know, 900 die, and you're down to, to 100, okay? The 100 are here. They will take up the resources, whatever's left of the ones that have died, to keep increasing. So the mean weight of survivors, remember I told you at the end of the day, what happens? You have a few individuals that are big, that can produce seeds and carry the, the species to the next generation. All plants, a lot of plants, shrubs, trees, follow this self-thinning rule. But you, for it to occur, okay, the densities have to be high. And again, you know, what is high? And the experiment has to last long. You can't do this after three days and expect plants to be dead, okay? And this is directly related to that law of constant final yield, okay? By the end of the day, you might have, you start out with 5,000 plants. This is for ragweed. These are actual data points. This is not made up. You started with 5,000 plants. At the end of the day, you have only 10 left, but their mean weight is substantial. In fact, all 10 produced seed and went on. Had none of them died, and there had been 5,000 plants, they would have all been this size. None of them would have produced seeds, which means that that species would become extinct in no time because these are annuals. Do you get the idea? So law of constant final yield is very much related to this. It's, Basically, we're in this room, look, we can't, there's not enough resources for all 25 of us. And basically, you know, some of us are going to leave this room, and the space that's left, my time commitment to the 25 has been reduced to 10, I focus on the 10. After that, it's still not enough, two more leave, I focus, basically when I get to one or two of you individuals, basically you're getting a one-on-one -on -one with me, okay? The, the idea being that you're going to get the most. You're going to graduate. You're going to get a good grade because I'm there. The reason, I have the resources to, to give to you. Okay? The question is, how do we decide who leaves? And that's what we don't understand yet. Is it just because just genetically these are pre-programmed? We don't really know why self-thinning, why certain individuals. Is it because they landed in a bad spot, in a micro, micro site? Their, their roots were, didn't get the nitrogen in that spot because we don't have homogeneity. Okay? So law of constant yield, final constant yield, and the self-thinning law, also known as Yoda's law. Yoda was the person who basically came up with this in the early 60s. These are important classic rules, okay? And so what it's saying is if ever you have your corn and you have a lot of weeds in there or you, put your, you plant your corn at too high densities, you're going to get self-thinning, okay? That's why we plant 30,000 plants and not 100,000 because you're going to waste seed, okay? Eventually, yeah, they'll die back and give you the same meal that you would have had if you put your 30,000 plants. So why should I spend, you know, more money if these, they're not going to give me a higher yield, okay? I'll leave it at that, okay? We'll finish with methods on Tuesday. So.